Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the Congressional Super Committee is a super failure. What does that mean for next year's Farm Bill? The Fall Flower and Garden Fest at Crystal Springs packs them in for another year. In Southern Gardening, how to grow hybrid roses in Mississippi. In the markets, some analysts see cattle prices grinding lower in December, while fewer peanuts mean higher peanut butter prices. In the feature segment, prescribed fire. It's actually a natural part of the southern pine ecosystem. Done properly, it benefits wildlife and forest health. It's important to remember that for hundreds of years, fire has been a, a part of the, the, the pine ecosystem in the southeast. Uh, it helped to control underbrush, uh, helped to uh, promote native grasses and native forbs that are important for wildlife species, uh, and, and helped also helped to reduce wildfire risk. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. By now you probably heard that the Congressional Super Committee failed to come to an agreement to cut $1.2 trillion from our federal budget. Well Leighton, this means even more drastic automatic cuts are set to take place. What will this mean for agriculture, especially with a new farm bill scheduled to take effect next year? Market to Market's Mark Pearson reports. Legislative negotiators had included farm bill reforms into a massive super committee plan to trim costs and overhaul the structure of federal farm programs. The move also was aimed at staving off farm bill negotiations in the midst of a budget-starved election year. Farm state negotiators have drifted toward a substantial overhaul of federal payments and the institution of a new shallow loss insurance program to protect farmers against minor financial losses due to weather or price swings. In a bipartisan statement, the Congressional Agriculture Committee Chairs Frank Lucas of Oklahoma and Debbie Stabenow of Michigan said, we are pleased we were able to work in a bipartisan way with committee members and agriculture stakeholders to generate sound ideas to cut spending by tens of billions of dollars. We will continue the process of reauthorizing the Farm Bill in the coming months and will do so with the same bipartisan spirit that has historically defined the work of our committees. While the bill authorizing current farm programs passed in 2008, despite being vetoed by President George W. Bush, it may be much more difficult in this election cycle. The proposed 2012 Farm Bill, ripe with already conceded budget cuts, could become an election year vehicle for all kinds of agendas, including unemployment benefit extensions, new tax cuts, and even fresh stimulus spending. And with a battle over the next farm bill looming on the horizon, agriculture and rural America itself could be caught up in this political fray more than ever before. Next, we return to this year's Fall Flower and Garden Fest at Mississippi State University's Truck Crops Branch. Along with trial gardens and specialty vendors, visitors learned about organic garden experiments and received decorating tips from a famed entertainment designer. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports. With the variety of flowers and vegetables, educational sessions, trial gardens, family activities, guest speakers, and hundreds of garden vendors, there seems to be no end to the Fall Flower and Garden Fest. Bill Evans, associate research professor at the MSU Truck Crops Branch Experiment Station, spoke to visitors about experiments with organic gardening in high tunnels. Through the National Organic Program, growers are required to build or maintain soil quality. One of the ways they can do that is by the use of cover crops. In a high tunnel system, that's a not well studied system for cover crop productivity. So we're trying to see how the cover crops perform in terms of the carbon uh, development of the soil and soil quality. The other thing that folks are going to get out of this is they're going to see that yes, they can grow crops beyond the first frost. Evans says last year's tomato crop produced through New Year's Eve. Catherine Strange, nationally renowned for her entertainment design books and television appearances, hosted a decorating session. 
She says beautiful decor can be created by repurposing what you already have. We use things upside down, sideways, backwards as well in order to uh, expand uh, the usage of items you might already have. For example, a uh, vase that you maybe think you can only use it one way. We'll turn it upside down and then use it as a stand, maybe for desserts or to uh, put a gourd up higher for an arrangement, uh, or sometimes to set another vase on top of it. People nowadays, because they're being invited into people's homes so, you know, less and less, People aren't opening their doors just for the reason that they're frightened that they don't have the things they need in order to entertain. Remember number one, people are thrilled that you invite them into your home. Then when they get there and they find that you've used things and done things that they could do but maybe hadn't thought of, it just adds to the fun. Strange says some of the best decorations are found right in your yard and can also be made into creative gifts for friends and family. From Crystal Springs, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Have you ever thought that shrub roses are the only kind of roses we can grow successfully in Mississippi? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us that selecting and growing beautiful grafted hybrid roses are the keys to success. Many gardeners in Mississippi think we can only be successful with roses like knockouts. Today I'm at K&M Roses where Jim and Daisy Mills have been growing beautiful and colorful hybrid roses for more than 20 years. Hybrid tea roses are very popular. They usually feature one flower on long sturdy stems which makes them great for cut flowers. The flowers are tightly spiraled and bowl shaped. The fragrance is very heady having layers of strong floral notes. Floribunda roses have more branching and will produce up to three or more flowers in clusters on each stem. Because of these clusters of showy flowers, Floribunda roses make great garden specimens. Most rose flowers are doubles, like this Abbey's Angel. But single flower forms are also common, such as this Aunt Ruth. I think the single flowers resemble camellia flowers with the stamens having a light feathery texture in the center. Most modern roses are grafted, much like fruit trees, because their roots are not very vigorous. The mills use the Fortuniana rootstock that grows successfully in Mississippi soil conditions. The hybrid roses match to the rootstock, and the graft is sealed much like placing a band-aid on a cut finger. After several weeks, the two pieces have healed together and become one plant. Roses can be high-maintenance flowers. They require consistent moisture and yearly fertilizing, and they also require regular spraying to protect them from both insect pests and plant diseases. Besides the beautiful flowers, the new foliage initially is a purplish red, adding even more color interest to the landscape. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says, keep in mind that grafted roses are more tolerant of our landscape conditions in Mississippi. Late in the feature segment, fire, not wildfire, but prescribed fire. We'll have the basics so you can start your own prescribed fire program. Time now for the markets with Leighton Span. And Leighton, you say that uh, peanuts are in the news. That's right, artists. A less than perfect growing season in some states has made the headlines. You'll find out why. Also ahead in this segment, uncertainty about the European Union has cotton prices bouncing. A lack of farmer selling affects the soybean market as some analysts give a bearish outlook for the beef sector in December. Like many commodities, cotton is viewing the EU debt crisis with uncertainty. At Wednesday's close, cotton was showing continued weakness. Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley stopped by Thursday morning to offer his analysis. Well, John Michael, where are we exactly with cotton right now in the market? Well, it's really a case of, of two different stories. You know, if you look domestically, uh, I've talked about it in the past, uh, the Southern Plains in a, in a pretty heavy drought, that's definitely impacting our, our U.S. crop. It's, it's much lower than where we thought we were, you know, at the beginning of the, of the season. But then you look globally, uh, you know, China, India, two countries that are, are having much larger crops than, than where they were at last year. And that's, uh, that's pushing ending stocks from a global standpoint up. 2010 carried into this year versus 2000, you know, projected of 2011 moving into next year, about a 10 million, 10 million bell jump in ending stocks for, for the crop. 
uh, that's definitely uh, pushed, pushed stocks up. And then on the, on the other side of the equation, you got demand, the demand picture. The economy hasn't, still isn't quite where we would like for it to be. And that's, uh, I've talked about in the past, cotton is much more finicky when it comes to, to price changes. And we've seen that, you know, somewhat lackluster demand over the past couple of months. The good news is that uh, following the, the Black Friday uh, shopping event, it's been projected about a little over $52 billion in sales. And uh, the National Retail Federation projects that about 51% of, of shoppers did pick up a clothing item and, and take it to the counter. So that's good news as we, as we move into the holiday season. But overall, the, the picture is just one of, of a bit of higher supply and demand still isn't, isn't where we would like to see it. Could December futures come down a little lower perhaps if, if export demand doesn't pick up? We're so close to the, the where that, that, you know, if we're in December already. I don't see a lot of movement on that contract. Uh, but as we, as we move into the, the next couple of months, we're going to really see uh, how much cotton, how many acres cotton needs to pick up. Uh, like I said, domestically, tremendous drought there. So uh, our U.S. stocks aren't very high. But globally, again, it's, it's where the, the glut of demand or glut of supply is coming from. With where uh, new crop prices are right now, is that going to be able to cover higher input costs that are likely going to be there for planting time in the spring? It's going to be tough, especially where we're at right now, and given the fact that, that, plant, that production costs are so high right now for all commodities, uh, and, and with the fact that we are seeing you know, corn and soybean prices you know, maintain their level. Obviously, they've come down a little bit as well, but they've not, they've not taken near the hit as cotton. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things progress as we get closer to planting. The latest supply and demand report reduced the projected number of U.S. soybean exports for 2011-2012. However, analyst Tom Fitzenmeyer notes that just in the last 10 days or so, we've had some export demand for beans show up. Uh, the Chinese bought a little bit last week. They, they're sort of our, our customer in, in right. beans. And how the bean price goes depends on whether they're there or not. Um, a lot of uh, assumptions are made that when we get closer to $11 in the futures, uh, that they will show up and start buying. Same thing on corn. A lot of assumption that when we got under 6 that maybe they would start buying corn, and that mm -hmm. hasn't happened. Um, but, you know, the, uh, South American crops... Brazil's 80% planted, Argentina's almost 60% planted, uh, in good shape, seem to get a rain when they need it, seems to be dry when they need it to be dry. The retail price of a popular product made from peanuts has gone up. The Associated Press reports peanut butter prices are up 30% or more now. Reportedly, the severity of last summer's heat in Texas and Georgia reduced the size of the U.S. peanut crop. That, along with the fact fewer peanuts were planted in this country to begin with this year, have led to the price increase at the grocery store for peanut butter. Well, that story brings us to the trivia quiz for the week, and here's the question. How many pounds of peanut products does the average consumer eat each year? Is it four and one-half pounds or six pounds? Could it be seven pounds or even 8.3 pounds? You'll find out in just a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the second part of the markets. Leighton Span reports on beef sales to Japan and the fact that U.S. beef prices could be moving down in December. In the feature segment today, prescribed fire or what some call prescribed burning in southern pine timber. Some can't imagine doing it, while others don't give it the respect it demands. It can, however, improve wildlife habitat and increase timber production. MSUcares.com is a popular website offering coordinated access to Mississippi State University's research and extension system. Now we have a Spanish language version of MSUcares.com where you'll find newsletters, brochures, and publications. Plus, you can view Spanish language videos on topics including credit, finances, and immunization. Visit MSUcares.com today and click on the En Español link for useful Spanish language information. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University's annual row crop short course takes place December 5th through the 7th on campus at Starkville. Now, if you didn't make the free registration deadline, it will cost you $40 at the door. Even if you have to pay, though, this meeting will save or make you money. The agenda includes Kip Colors of Missouri, the holder of the soybean world record. We'll have registration and agenda information on the Farm Week calendar. The annual Delta Ag Expo takes place Tuesday and Wednesday, January 17th and 18th in Cleveland. The doors open at 8.30 both days. 
It may be one of the best bargains you'll see this year because there's no fee to enter. The Mississippi Delta Farm Toy Show is Saturday, January 28th. The location is the Coma County Expo Center in Clarksdale. The hours are 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. There's no admission fee. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Despite all the fundamentals arguing for a bull market for cattle and beef, market participants remain nervous, according to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. One big question is whether domestic consumers have the ability to absorb the expected inflation in beef prices. Analyst Jamie Kohaki is pessimistic after the last cattle on feed report. Here's his analysis. Uh, it was bearish. I like bear spreading the whole meat complex, cattle and pork, sell nearbys, uh, buy the spring contracts. Uh, the live cattle market, I think, put a, sh put a high in the cash market last week. I'm bearish through year end right now. I like selling the, the fab up around 126, and uh, I think just look for this thing to grind lower into the mid part of December. Uh, after that, if the market trends back higher, exports are still very, very strong. I don't see those backing off uh, right now, but uh, short term, the, the market is topped out in my opinion. Jamie Kohaki mentioned strong exports. Another positive for cattle in that regard is the prospect of increased U.S. sales to Japan. Japan is in the process of raising the age limit on beef from the United States. The U.S. Meat Export Federation says it will probably not change until next spring, but that organization is positive the move will open up the opportunity to sell more U.S. beef in Japan. Well, let's look now at that trivia answer for you and check your knowledge about peanut consumption in the United States. B is the correct choice. The average consumer in this country eats six pounds of peanut products each year. It seems counterintuitive at first glance. Fire can actually help wildlife and timber growth. In the feature segment today, we give you the basics of what is called prescribed burning or prescribed fire. Fire is actually a natural part of the southern pine ecosystem. When used properly by man, it can increase wildlife numbers and improve forest health. Back in the spring of 2010, we visited Orby and Brenda Wright. They were honored in January of that year with the Outstanding Conservationist Award by the Mississippi Association of Conservation Districts. Farmer visited the Wrights when a prescribed burn took place on their property. We like the long leaf ecosystem and and we've been in several programs that, that help us with that also to promote the gopher tortoise. And, and it's great for uh, fox squirrels and quail and turkey and deer. Orby Wright and his wife Brenda bought the land in 1988 that would eventually become Quail Hollow Ranch. You wouldn't know it today, but the Wrights say the land was pretty well cut over and needed reforestation. The Wrights sought out public and private forestry expertise and developed a plan to restore the property. Fourteen years later, in 2002, they were the Mississippi Forestry Association's Outstanding Tree Farmers of the Year. The next year, they were the Southern Region Tree Farmers of the Year. In January 2010, they received the Wildlife Conservationist Award from the Mississippi Association of Conservation Districts. The Wrights love the outdoors so much, they burn it. It's important to remember that for hundreds of years, Fire has been a, a part of the, the, the pine ecosystem in the southeast. Uh, it helped to control underbrush. Uh, it helped to uh, promote native grasses and native forbs that are important for wildlife species. Uh, and and helped also helped to reduce wildfire risk. If you look uh, in, in the western part of the United States these days, in California and Montana and those type of areas, you see they were always having wildfires. And the primary reason is that is because we've taken fire out of the equation. Rush Walsh is the president of the Mississippi Prescribed Fire Council and the chairman of the Lamar County Soil and Water Conservation District. Walsh says the southern pine forest and its wildlife are adapted to fire. As long as the fire stays out of the treetops, southern pines can take the heat. The fire also clears out the understory, creating anew the habitat that the animals of the southern pine ecosystem need. Fire just starts the, the process of, of plant succession over. We reduce the, the woody growth and the, and the hardwood competition. Um, we reduce all the dead grasses. Uh, so f right after a burn for the summer, several uh, summers after the burn, 
Um, we have all of these lush plants coming back, all these native grasses and all of these um, broadleaf weeds that are going to provide food sources and cover. The proper use of fire in pine timber and wildlife management is called prescribed burning. As the name implies, it's not done indiscriminately. It's planned for the given area to be burned. A person certified in prescribed burning creates the prescription. The certified prescribed burn managers have gone through uh, the burning short course uh, in Mississippi. And these, they learn about weather patterns, they learn about uh, firing techniques, they learn about fuel loads and fuel conditions and, and right burning conditions. They know all of the, the pieces uh, to the puzzle of a prescribed burning. To legally conduct a prescribed burn in Mississippi, you must have a notarized burn plan for the site. A certified prescribed burn manager must be on site during the burn. You must secure a burn permit from the Mississippi Forestry Commission on the day of the prescribed burn. There are advantages to following the law. By using a certified prescribed burn manager, you have an experienced person who knows how to conduct a prescribed burn where it won't get out of control. Following the law also gives you legal protection. If you have followed the letter of the law, which means you had your burn plan, burn manager on site, you got a burn permit, then um, if a fire gets out and, and causes damage to a neighboring property, then they have to prove negligence, that you were negligent on your part. And if you followed all those steps, it's going to be very hard um, for them to prove that negligence. The rights conduct prescribed burns every year, but they do not burn every acre every year. Longleaf typically, this we burn every other year, at least we try to. And then, of course, we rotate different areas and leave some un unburned areas for nesting for turkeys and quail. As, as fires move through here, they're not just going to be in that stand and get burned up. They're going to move out, but they've, all, they've got cover to go to because uh, we haven't burned all the property at one time. They've got cover to move to. So wildlife are very uh, resistant to prescribed fire and, and also very adapted. Just as I went up the house a while ago is bringing the water back, there was four fox squirrels in the front yard. Just, you know, you just, you have geese in the back, and I saw two big turkeys walk across the yard this morning, and you know, you just, that's just something that, that not everybody, you just can't have without working at it. Prescribed burning is not done simply by getting on the upwind side of a track and allowing the fire to sweep across the entire track at one time. Torches are used to set fire to small strips, working from the downwind edge of the track to the upwind side. This keeps the fire manageable out of the treetops and it's much less likely to jump the fire lanes. Smoke is one of the biggest concerns in prescribed burning. Weather conditions must allow it to rise into the sky. Smoke that stays on the ground could create dangerous driving conditions on nearby roads. The biggest factor that we face with, with burning today is smoke. Smoking in highways and, and residential neighborhoods and that's where uh, that, that burn permit really comes in and says, hey, smoke is allowed to disperse well today. Gary Blair, South Area Vice President with the Mississippi Association of Conservation Districts says the rights were deserving of the MACD's Wildlife Conservationists of the Year Award. They're involved in reestablishing the gopher tortoise on their property. Blair says the rights have also assisted the Lamar County Soil and Water Conservation District by hosting education events for landowners and youth. The property has been a training site for the MACD-sponsored Envirothon competition. A lot of our programs now are geared toward education. I would say that's our largest component is educating not only the public and the farmers and the landowners, but also our young people, our students. Uh, we do a lot of our programs are geared toward our young people and getting them aware of what conservation practices are and what things that they can do uh, to assist the uh, the natural resources that, the God, that God has given us. Using poplar lumber salvaged after Hurricane Katrina swept through their property, the Wrights have built a Creekside Pavilion. That's something that, that we wanted to do and it, it gives us an opportunity to, to have a place so that we can have the school kids come in and we have field days down here and things like that. It's just a, it's, it's an ideal spot rather than in a more residential kind of setting. Brenda Wright says getting young people interested and knowledgeable about conservation is vital. Well, if the young people aren't interested and don't learn about it, it ends with, you know, these generations. But uh, 
Most young people, given the opportunity, they love the outdoors. And if you're interested in watching this story again, go to our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also go to our Facebook page or go to our YouTube page. We'll also have some telephone numbers and links to a variety of agencies where you can get additional information on prescribed burning or prescribed fire. That's farmweek.msucares.com. And Layton might mention, uh, my brothers and I are wanting to do some prescribed burning on our parents' property down in uh, Smith County. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get it done because we could never get the conditions just right. We've got a chick some chicken houses nearby, and obviously we didn't need the smoke to right. get over there. So. Uh, be sure to get a prescribed burn manager to do this with, and it helps you out a lot. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. Next week, we'll see how Christmas flowers can have a big effect on the lives of children. We'll travel to Columbus, Mississippi, where the Palmer Home for Children sells poinsettias and other plants to support its programs. Besides the money, the greenhouse operation helps the young people learn how to work and to be responsible. Join us for the grand reopening of the Mississippi 4-H Museum in Jackson. There's more than 100 years of Mississippi 4-H history on display. In Southern Gardening, cool season whimsy. Don't let the winter cool off your personality. For the rest of Farmer Crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.